Thank you so much for joining us today on YouTube. If you haven't already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below so you can stay up to date with all that Church on the Hill has going on. If you haven't already, also follow us on social media, either Instagram or Facebook, both Church on the Hill and our senior pastor, Pastor Adam McCain. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the message. Remember, the key scripture coming out of this whole series is coming right here out of Mark chapter 10, verse 27. And it's for, for everybody that's been in this series, this verse has just been the verse that's just resonating. It seems to be repetitive, but let me tell you something. It is truth. And if you leave with nothing else from this series, leave with this key scripture here. And Jesus replies to them in Mark chapter 10, verse 27. And it says like this. It says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. I want you to leave with that throughout this whole series, knowing in your heart, knowing by faith that with, all, with God, all things are possible. Your situation might look daunting. It might look hopeless. But let me tell you something. With you, absolutely it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Come on, in the midst of a pandemic, trying to teach our kids from, from homeschool, being in Zoom and, and this or that, man, it, it's impossible for me to teach my kid fourth grade common core math. But with God, all things are possible. Come on, right now it seems to be that this nation is being divided between Democrats and Republicans and, and Libertarians and Independents and all of these things. And we seem to have battle lines drawn, drawn between even our skin tones. But let me tell you something, we are fighting in the midst of all of that for a multicultural church, multiracial church, multigenerational church, and all of those things. And the world will look at us and say, that's impossible to have. Well, absolutely with man that's impossible, but with God... All things are possible. And we're seeing miracles happen in our midst. Come on, you look across this room and you don't see just one skin tone. You look across this room, you don't just see one generation of people. You see it all. Right now we were sitting in the sanctuary full of miracles this morning. And we are closing out this, this last part of our God of Miracles series. And we're titled it Axe Head Prayers. Look to the person next to you, Axe Head Prayers. Look to the other person next to you and say, that person just breathed on me. And I'm not sure if they, were, if they had that stuff or not, man. But, but they just whispered to me, acts of prayers. It's kind of, kind of weird. But we're going to be in 1 fir, in uh, John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is where our key scripture comes out of. It comes out of this right here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And it reads like this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. He's saying that we come knowing that we have confidence that whatever, that, that, that when we ask God for something, he hears us. We have that confidence. I think a lot of times in, in, in our relationship with Jesus, in our walk as believers, we sometimes get into this spot where we have a lack of confidence. And when we get into that lack of confidence, we get into that, to that spot where we're like, Lord, look, I'm really not sure if you're, if you're happy with me. I'm really not sure if I've pleased you this week. I'm really not sure how bad I've blown it. But if you might, if you could. And we come to him and we, we, we pray to him like that, in that manner. Well, if you've got time or if you've got a little bit of an opportunity or in between what you've got going, Lord. But the scripture is saying right here that we can approach him in confidence, and when we approach him in confidence, we have the confidence not only that we have a relationship with him, but that he hears us. We have confidence that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that when we ask God for something, he hears it. He's not some, some faraway God. He's not some dead God. We don't just say our prayers in our room to make us feel good, that they hit the ceiling and they bounce down. Not at all. He's saying when we pray, we have confidence that we know that God hears us. And when we pray his will, not only do I have confidence that he hears us, but I have confidence that he's already given me what I've asked for. And we'll get into that spot where like, Lord, look, well, maybe you didn't hear me because I didn't get what I asked for. And not every time when we pray in his will do we get exactly what we've asked for. Because sometimes in our finite mind, in our way of thinking, we're not, we're not quite sure what God is doing in the grand scheme of things. And sometimes your miracle comes about in a different way. Sometimes your miracle comes about by him saving you for the thing that you were praying for. By, by, by moving you just a little bit to the left and saying, son, let me tell you something. If I would have given you that right now, that would have killed you. But when we get there, we have this confidence. 
When I approach God, man, I know, Lord Jesus, when I pray, what I think is the answer to this situation, when I pray, what I'm believing for, I trust, I have confidence that you hear me. And I also have trust and confidence that you know exactly what you're doing, that you know exactly what you're doing. So it might not be what I prayed for, it might not be exactly what I've asked for, but I trust and I have confidence, Lord, that you know exactly what you're doing. My kids ask my grandparents, excuse me, their grandparents with confidence anything that they want. They, they ask with such confidence, Grandma, Papa, can I have this? Grandma, my granddaddy, can I have that? And I have to watch them. I'm like, hey, kids, you can't be asking Grandma, Papa for stuff all the time. We were over at my parents' house one, one evening, and, uh, and my daughter was sitting with my mom on the sofa, and they were on the iPad or whatever, and she's just kind of, she's kind of, you know, whispering and talking to Grandma. I said, hey, 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 what's going on over here? She's like, oh, nothing, Daddy, nothing. Just, just sitting here shopping with Grandma. I was like, shopping? She's like, yeah, I just set Grandma up with an Amazon account. She now knows that everything that says Prime can be delivered to her within two days. She doesn't have to go. Just set Grandma up with a Prime account. I'm like, are you kidding me? She's like, yeah. Now my mom is crazy addicted to Amazon. She's getting all these packages sent to her. It's, it's crazy. But my kids have confidence that when they ask, they're going to get something. They're not intimidated by it. They're not saying, hey, maybe if, if you could, maybe this, that, or the other. No, they come and they ask with confidence. That's what I want us leaving here with this morning, is that we would have a renewed confidence that what we ask God for, he's already moving for. He already knows what we're going to ask before we ask it. And we know that if he hears us, we have the confidence that no, that the answer is already on the way. That we know he's already said yes. The key scripture coming out, excuse me, the key passage coming out this morning is going to be out of 2 Kings chapter 6. If you've got your Bible, turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. This is an awesome passage. Beginning of 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 is where we're going to be. But I want to give you a little bit of background of what's happening right here. We have this guy by the name of Elisha. And Elisha was a prophet under who studied under Elijah. And, and Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire. And we see that, that when, when Elijah is, is given the name of Elisha, when he's given that name, the Lord is, is picking his successor. Who's going to take over for him for the prophet of Israel? Who's going to be God's voice to his nation? And he picks Elisha. When Elijah goes and, and, and he goes to find Elisha, Elisha's out in a field plowing with his oxen. The Bible says he's got 12 oxen that he's plowing with. Elisha lives a normal life. He has a normal job. He's a, he's a farmer. They're working the family's you know, land, all of these things. Elisha wasn't some scholar. Elisha wasn't, wasn't a guy that studied. Elisha was just a normal guy who loved God. And when Elisha, and when, when Elijah was praying for the successor and, and the Holy Spirit spotlighted Elisha, you have to assume that Elisha was already living a life after God. From that moment on, Elisha and Elijah were together. I mean, they, 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 were, they were hanging out all the time. And Elisha was serving God under this man. He was going and they were doing things. And, and all sorts of miracles Elisha was seeing done by Elijah, learning from him. And when it was time for Elijah to be taken up into heaven, Elisha's with him. And Elijah kind of keeps telling him, hey, man, I'm going over here. You need to go over there. He says, I will not leave you, man of God. I won't leave you. Finally, they get to the Jordan River. And Elijah's going to be taken up here. And they get to the river, and they're going to cross the other side. Elijah takes his cloak off, and he smacks the water with it. And the, and, the, and the river splits open, and they're able to walk to the other side. And as they're walking there, Elijah asks him, Elisha, what do you want? And Elisha says, Elijah, I want a double portion of your anointing. He says, if you see me taken up, he says, it'll be yours. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that this chariot of fire comes down and takes up Elijah. And Elisha's standing there by himself. And left is Elijah's cloak. Elisha grabs that cloak and is going back across the Jordan River where this company of prophets, about 400 men, are sitting there waiting for him. As he gets there, he does the same miracle, his first miracle, the same way that he saw Elijah do. He takes Elijah's cloak and he smacks that water and the Jordan River opens up and he's able to cross to the other side. We see Elisha living a life, man, that was after God, praying for God, spending time with God. We see throughout Scripture that he's known as a holy man. Scripture records that there's this well-to-do lady, this family, 
And they've got this house, and they would set up a room just for Elisha when he was passing through to stay and to be with them. And one day their, their, their kid, they were praying for their kid to, they were praying to conceive and they had a baby and something happened to the kid's head. He hit his head or something. They go and they find Elisha. Elisha comes and he brings that boy back to life. I mean, we see Elisha really living a life going after God. We also see him that he is, he's leading this company of prophets, about these, about 400 men with their families. And these are, these are like um, um, JV kind of players to Elijah and Elisha's varsity. They're, they're, they're in training, they're learning, there's some administrative people within that whole thing, the company of prophets. But these guys collectively consult the nation on what God is doing. Battle plans, where they're moving, where they're eating, all of these different things. The company of prophets really consult the nation, and Elisha is leading them. And in First Kings chapter, excuse me, Second Kings chapter six, verse one, we find it right here. This passage, we're going to read it starting in chapter one, verse one. It says the company of prophets said to Elisha, "Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us." Let's go back to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, go. Then one of the servants said to him, he came back to him and says, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied. And he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began cutting down trees. And as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick, threw it in there. And made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and he took it. So these guys, the company of prophets, they're all there. And they're basically, they're living together in this commune. They're living together in this place. And they come to Elisha and they say, Elisha, this place that we're living is too small. Man, I'm having more kids. Man, we, we, we got we to expand this place. Let's go down to the Jordan. Let's cut some poles. Let's build us a bigger place to live. It's really nice down there. Let's go, Elisha. And scholars would say that Elisha wasn't too apt to go. He really didn't want to go all that much. But they kind of convinced him, and they said, let's go, man. And Elisha finally says, all right, let's go ahead, and let's go. So they go down to the Jordan River, and they've got this guy who, who, is, who is borrowing an axe, and he's cutting his trees, he's cutting his thing, and all of a sudden, the axe head flies off, and it goes into the water. I kind of know what this guy feels like. I, I understand if you've ever worked with a borrowed tool, if you've ever worked with something that's borrowed, you take extra care of it. You're, you're kind of like, you know, man, because it's not mine. If it's mine, I'll beat it up. I'll do whatever I want. Why? Because I own it. This guy is he's using a borrowed axe. I would imagine he's a younger guy, probably didn't have a whole lot of money. I've learned as I've gotten a little bit older that I have an affinity for tools now. Like when I was younger, I didn't care about tools. Like, I don't care about tools, you know. I would borrow my dad's tools. But now I, I can tell I'm getting a little bit older because now instead of looking like at the ads, you know, for, for, for different clothes or whatever, I'm like finding the Home Depot Black Friday ads. I'm like, yeah. And then, and then now I know I'm even getting older because I, when you're kind of in that middle stage, you know, you're buying tools for what you need, right, for the project that you're doing, you're buying, you're buying those tools. Now I find myself getting a little bit older and I'm buying tools for the projects I might do, right? And so I was like, I might need that one day. You're right. I might need that. And we see this kid, man, he's using a borrowed axe. I'll never forget this one time. I was about 16 years old, 17. I'm helping my dad with a project. We're building a deer stand. We love to hunt. So we're building a deer stand. And, and I pull out this, this hammer from the toolbox. And my dad just, all of a sudden, man, he, it was just like something happened to him. He just went to another place. Whew. He's like, that's my hammer. I was like, yeah, dad, this is your toolbox. Everything in here is yours, dad. He's like, no. That's my hammer I bought when I was 16 years old from my first job working construction. And I was like, wow, Dad. And he's like, wow, that hammer cost me $1.99. He knew, like, the price and everything with it, right? I was like, yeah, Dad, whatever, man. I just need to hammer this thing in. And as, I, as I'm beating this thing in, he's telling me his story, right? And I'm just using this hammer. And all of a sudden, the head of that hammer goes flying off. Pow! It, it goes flying off. I broke his hammer. He's like, I used that hammer every day for my first job. And it never broke. I've had it all the way to the age I'm at right now, 40 years old, and it never broke. You use it for nine times, and you break it. And I was like, he's like, what are you doing? And he, he was kind of mad, and he was crying. He just kind of left. I was like, oh, my gosh, what did I do? So I was trying to, like, put it back together. I was like, no, it's fine, Dad. You know, I was trying to put it back together. I was like, oh, no. So I understand the way the, this guy feels is that axe head goes flying off. 
He's not concerned about, hey, I'm not able to cut any more poles. He's not concerned about that. All he's wrapped up and consumed with is, oh my gosh, the borrowed axe that I used is now broken. The axe head is laying in the water. There's no getting that thing out. And I have to come back and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to be indebted to this guy. And we see Elisha as he goes and he finds him. He says, man of God, I need your help. The axe had fell into the water. It wasn't mine. It was borrowed. And we see Elisha come back and perform a miracle. Elisha doesn't really even want to be here. The situation wouldn't have happened if they would have just listened to Elisha. Right? If they would have have just listened to him, this whole situation wouldn't be here. And we see Elisha do this thing. And he cuts this, this, this tree down and he, he shaves his branch and he tosses it into the water. And the axe head floats up. It's crazy. There's no, there's no real kingdom impact to this thing. There's not, you know, six people were healed that day. Elisha does a miracle for this guy in the everyday kind of things. And as I begin to read that thing, I begin to understand that, that Elisha is a man of God. Elisha is the prophet for the day. I mean, he is it. But this guy that's with him is also a prophet, also has a relationship with God, also is is doing his best to go after him. So what happens here that this guy, all of a sudden, he gets into this spot where the axe head falls, it's in the bottom of the river, he panics. He has the same access to God as Elisha does, but he panics. And the difference between these two people is, is that Elisha had confidence in his relationship with God where this kid had no confidence in it. It was shook, it was changed, it was different. He began to think about all the repercussions of what he was doing. This is not my accent. I'm going to owe this guy whatever he charges me for. Oh my gosh, he began to be overwhelmed with the details of all of the bad things that are going to happen when Elisha's, Elisha's response was, God, do a miracle. God, do a miracle. I'm expecting you to do a miracle right here. I'm expecting you to do this. We see Elisha as he was raised up under Elijah. I would imagine that that Elijah would share with him the stories. Hey, man, let me tell you this one time. I had just called down the fire God and the prophets of Baal, and I was on the run. There's nothing to eat. We called down a drought, and all of a sudden the Lord set me up with this place. He said, hey, man, go hang out by this brook in this valley over here. And I'm going to send these ravens to bring you food. Elisha, it was crazy. Every day the, the ravens would show up. They're bringing me food every day. Then the Lord set me up by this, by this brook. I mean, you got to understand. Remember, there's no water in the land. It's not raining or nothing like that. And the Lord set me up by this brook. And when that thing dried up, he told me to go find this widow lady. It was crazy, Elisha. I went and found this lady, and she's collecting sticks so that her and her son can go die. They, they got no food. And the Lord did a miracle. Man, she was able to make me some food. The oil and, and, and the, the flour sustained for her. It was crazy. Elisha, let me tell you something, man. The God is, is with us, man. And he grew up knowing these stories. He grew up hearing these stories. He was trained and raised under the prophet Elijah. And then we see Elisha's life in the same way, where he had this total dependence on God. He had this complete dependence on God, on what he was going to do. He expected to see miracles every day in his life. He was dependent on those miracles. And we see in in this moment, this young prophet's life, that we see that all of a sudden this insecurity began to set in as he had a lack of confidence in his relationship with God. Come back and say, well, maybe I could have done things a little bit better. Maybe, maybe I, I could have done this a little better. Maybe if it wasn't my idea that we come here and we be here, this whole thing wouldn't have happened. And he runs and he goes to Elisha and says, Elisha, man, this thing fell in the water. Needs your help. And he asks him, where did, you, where did you lose it? Where did you drop it? And he shows him where it is. And he throws that thing in there and it floats up. Elisha doesn't reach in there to grab it and give it to him. He tells him, hey, bro, go ahead and get that thing out. I believe it was significant that Elisha told him to reach in there and to do that. So he could show him and teach him, hey, I want you to tangibly see the miracle God did. I want your feet to get wet as you reach in there and see that the impossible thing happened. 
that axe head that was sitting at the bottom of that river, man. Get your feet wet. Get in there. I want you to grab that thing. I want you to feel what that thing felt like. I want you to understand the miracle and the significance of what that thing is. I imagine that Elisha could have had that thing float straight to the bank. He could have just picked it up next to all the other rocks. But he makes him reach in there and grab that thing. I mean, he wanted to boost his confidence. So let me tell you, son, you are a man of God, a prophet called by God. Come on, you are learning, you are growing, and you can do the same things that I'm doing, man. The relationship with God is not a respecter of persons. Anybody has a relationship with me, has access to these miracles. I believe Elisha was trying to teach him something in this moment. Boost his confidence as a man of God. Looked at him and said, son, look, I'm not going to ridicule you. I'm not going to call you out for what you haven't done. I'm not going to call you out for the things that you have done. I'm simply going to come in here. I'm going to do a miracle, man, and I'm going to watch God. God work, and it's going to boost your confidence in this thing. We need to have that kind of confidence in the expectancy that when we pray, we believe God hears us and he's going to do something. We need to have that kind of confidence that immediately when we see our situation change, our, our first call isn't to our small group leader saying, hey, bro, what are you doing? Our first call is straight to God and say, Jesus, I need a breakthrough in this situation. I'm looping my small group leader in because I want them believing and praying with me, but I have direct access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who can change and shift every bit of my situation. I don't need to go to another high priest. I've got access to the high priest, and so we need to be going after that, our confidence needs to be restored in that. So how do we see these axe head prayers happen? How do we develop these type of, of, of axe head prayers? How do we develop that confidence in these things? I want you to write these three things down on how we develop the, the, the confidence to pray these axe head prayers. The first one is this right here. It comes from time logged. It comes from time logged. You got to have time logged with Jesus. You got to have that. In order to have that confidence, in order to, to build that relationship, you have to have that time logged. We see Elisha was spending time with God all the time. He was spending time with God all the time. His life was lived miraculously. I mean, it's crazy to see some of the things Elisha did. You can go back and you can read it. But as, as Elijah was taken up and he was taken away, Elisha's kind of sad. His friend, his mentor, the guy that he's been with, all of a sudden has now been taken away. And we see that, that Elijah spent time with God, and he modeled that for Elisha, and Elisha did the same thing, spent time with God, knew God. And we see there in, in 2 Kings, after Elijah's been taken away, Elisha's walking back, and he's sad. He, he's, he's pretty sad. And there's these boys that come up to him, and they be kinda, they're kind of making fun of him. You go back and you research this. They call him Baldy. They're like, hey, Baldy, look at you. Get out of here, Baldy. And Elisha gets so frustrated. He gets so mad, but he's got such a confidence in God that he understands, and he calls down these bears. These bears come out of the woods, go back and read it, and they, they maul 40 of these little kids because they're making fun of him. Could you imagine that? They call, they call me fat. Lord, send your bears. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, <clears throat> go get them. I'm going to eat my tacos while you just go ahead and maul them. Watch it out, dude. Look at that. Mm -hmm, who's fat now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bleeding a little bit. Look, wipe it. There you go. The bears got you. It's crazy, but we see God, that, that Elisha had that relationship with God. Why? Because that time logged. I think a lot of times we, we, we lose confidence in our relationship with Jesus because of a lack of time logged. I've got such a great relationship with my wife. Why? Because we spend all day together now because of quarantine, right? And so it's like, so awesome. Now 24-7 we're together, right? But it's crazy. I've got time logged with her. When I text her, I don't, I, don't, I don't like, hey, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. How are the kids? I hope they're doing great. Hey, if you have a chance, would you mind sending me so-and-so's phone number? Right. No, it's not at all. It's like, hey, babe, can you text me their number? Right. I, there's no pleasantries there. It's just, it's just straight business. Why? Because, because of that time logged. There's no insecurity there. That she's like, you only want me because I do this or I do that. Not at all. I mean, we have a relationship together. I think a lot of times we'll get into that spot where we're like, look, Lord, we don't have enough time logged with you. That we're all of a sudden we're saying, all right, look, Lord, I feel like every time I'm asking you, I'm calling you, it's like I'm asking you for something. And because of that, we lose that lack of confidence. This is what it says right here in first in Psalms chapter one, verse one. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of the, of the sinners or sit with the company of mockers, but th whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves do not wither, and whatever they do 
prospers. Come on, man, I want to be like that. I want to be the people that meditate on God's word day and night. I want to be that, that my leaves won't wither and that everything I do prospers. I want to have that kind of time logged with God. That, man, my first reaction is go straight to him. My first reaction is going straight to him. Lord, you're the source. You're where it comes from, Lord Jesus. I need you right now. I want to have that kind of confidence. The second thing is this right here. As you're able to pray axe head prayers, when you understand there's no shame for your brokenness. There's no shame for your brokenness. Jesus teaches us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. And he opens it up with this. He says, this is how you should pray. He says, our Father in heaven. We, that we're talking to our dad. That confidence that you have when, you, when you're talking to your pops. You say, hey, dad, look, man, this is what I need. That I, I need some wisdom. And there, there's, there's no kind of, you know, hey, man, you, you come quietly into his presence. My son busts into my room. Dad, I got this question for you. All right, son, what do you, what do you got, man? If, uh, if, a, if a great white shark and a T-Rex were to fight, who do you think will win? I don't, dude, I don't know. I don't care. He, a great white shark probably, Dad. All right, thanks, son. Like, okay. All right, man. Awesome, dude. W- whatever. He asks me the most random questions that have no bearing to, to anything. I'm like, why are you asking me? It makes no sense. Why are you asking me that? Well, I saw it on YouTube. Okay, who freaking cares, man? I, I don't care. Why are you asking me that right now, man? He's like, I don't know. Bye, Dad. I was like, okay, see you, son. Adios, man. He just come running in my room. Hey, Dad, this, that. He asks with confidence. Why? Because there's no shame there. He's not worried about how I spanked him 30 minutes before because he asked me the same question about the, 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 the you know, shark and the dinosaur. You know, pow, pow, you got spanked for that because the timing was wrong. He, he doesn't care. He doesn't come in and say, hey, man, Dad, Dad spanked me two days ago. I wonder if he's still mad at me. No, he's not, he's not mad about He's not worried about that at all. There's no shame for his brokenness there. He's not even, he doesn't even know what he doesn't know. That the questions he's asking, like, why are you, that doesn't even make any sense. Why are you asking that? What? He doesn't know. There's no shame for his brokenness there. When we come in and we ask for God for things, man, we need to approach him as he's our father. He's our dad. Come on, our father who are in heaven. Dad, I need you, man. I need you right now, dad. Man, I need you. The third thing is this right here. If we're going to pray axe head prayers, we need to be aligned with purpose. We need to be aligned with purpose. We need to be doing our best to go and after the things of God doing our best to be in his will right where he's at. I want you to see this video of, uh, of Danny Avent, Miracle Man. I believe Danny's with us this morning, but I want you to watch his testimony right now. Let's go ahead and put it on for him. Hey, everybody. I'm sitting here with my father-in-law, Mr. Danny Avent, or as I affectionately call him, Papa. Yeah, and uh, Papa, you had a crazy event last year. And uh, it's really a miracle that you're, that you're here with us today. I want you to tell us that moment you're in the driveway in your truck and what happens. Pick up right there. I felt like I'd been zipped from top to bottom. It was a, felt exactly like a zipper being unzipped from my throat all the way down to my belly button. And it was very painful. Like something ripped open inside of you. Right. That's what, this was a sensation I had. Wow. And Felt like hot water went down my legs, and then I felt a pain in my jaw, and I go, oh my gosh, I'm having a heart attack. Well, it turns out I had suffered an aortic dissection. And, and what's an aortic dissection? An aortic dissection is when your aorta, which is your main artery coming from your heart that goes to the rest of your body, brings the main blood supply to the, the entire rest of your body. You, you stumble inside your home and, uh, and, and collapse on the floor. Exactly. And my wife called 911. That's the last thing I remember. Yeah, and as your family, I think it was Memorial Day. We were, actually, we were having uh, a Memorial Day meal with, with my kids, and we get this call. I just got the steaks off the grill. I get this call, call that Papa's got something serious that happened. And uh, so we leave the meal there, and we rush to the hospital. And, uh, and you are, you're in serious trouble. So after eight hours of misdiagnosis and not getting you into emergency surgery, you should have been a dead man. Should have, that's no question. They finally found a doctor, a doctor by the name of Wu, Dr. Jeffrey Wu in Fort Worth. He's a premier, if not the premier cardiothoracic surgeon in the Metroplex. They rushed me over there and they commenced, he commenced the surgery. He put together his team. It's a six hour surgery to save my life. 
they, they, they fixed the, the immediate problem, but then I developed another problem. Yeah. I bled into my chest and, and developed what's known as a cardiac tamponade, which basically is like a hydraulic lock in your heart. There's no room for it to beat because it's surrounded by a massive amount of blood. Yeah. You've already been under the knife seven hours. You're already 12, 15 hours way past where you should be you know, even fixing all this, you shouldn't be alive at this point, and now they've got to open you back up and fix this other thing. They opened me back up and fix it, and they did. They opened me back up and they were to fix it. What percentage of people survived that operation? It's very, very slim. It's, a, it's extremely serious. Yeah, they, they told us as a family, you, this, I mean, we did our best with the first one, but this is probably the death sentence right here. Yeah, that's, that's what I was told. Yeah, and it was supernatural. Medically, it's not explainable that I'm alive. It's only by the grace of God that I'm alive. Yeah, yeah. Papa, you are a miracle. Now, I want you to just speak to this real quick. You haven't always believed in, uh, in miracles. I, I, I was raised in a church that didn't believe in miracles, that uh, miracles were limited to the, to the 12 apostles, and uh, that, that God doesn't use people to heal today, and God doesn't heal today. Yeah. But that was, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you don't believe that anymore? No. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, am, I am living proof that God is the God of miracles and God does heal because he healed me. Oh, yeah, and I'm grateful. And your grandkids are grateful. Yep. And Church on the Hill is grateful. I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, wasn't that a great word today? You know, I'm so thankful that the word isn't limited to a Sunday morning at a certain time or the four walls of the church building, but it can go through whatever time you may be watching this, wherever venue you might be at. The word of God can minister to you no matter where you are. You know, if you're interested in partnering with what Church on the Hill is doing, not only locally, but globally, you say, I really want to invest with that, with Church on the Hill in advancing kingdom business. And you can do so by partnering with us by sending a donation to PO Box 3815. Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106. Hey guys, we love you. We look forward to seeing you again.